is Messi. It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis. Right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. The Bundesliga has showed us that it can be done. So Formula One, what's good? Welcome to it. This is ZFM Sport on a Tuesday, top hit Tuesday, the lockdown edition. From our homes to the comfort of your homes, you'll hear from Barry Menandi, Mike Madoda, Mark Paz, Chris and Alois Bunjira. My name is Sean Tafirenika. I'm the producer of ZFM Sport. I hope you're staying at home and being safe. Tonight on the show, we've got our Formula One report brought to you by Zimoko, a local sports news roundup, as well as around the world in 60. In the second half of the show, we've got our play of the day and updates from the beautiful game where you can look forward to that news of Bayer Leverkusen's win over Werder Bremen last night, plus news from the Premier League about training procedures and possible league resumption. Our feature tonight, though, is a really good one. Our feature is going to be on all-time great Olympians. We'll profile those golden athletes who bag gold medals in the greatest sports spectacle in the world. Hit us up, the handles at ZFM Sport on Facebook and Twitter. Let us know who are the greatest Olympians of all time and what some of your memories are of the Olympics and how these star athletes performed. For now, let's dive into our power play before we get our local sports news roundup with pause. The Home Front. Local sports news and analysis. Straight into our local sports roundup. Uh, we'll start with cricket. Former Zimbabwe cricket captain and coach Ahi Streak believes he could have joined the exclusive club of 300 test wicket takers had he added a few more seasons to his playing career. Taking 300 or more wickets across a playing career is considered a significant achievement in test cricket. Streak, who is Zimbabwe's all time leading wicket taker in both test and ODI matches, ended his career prematurely at the height of domestic problems in Zimbabwe in 2005. Retiring at just 31, he felt he missed the best part of his career after an international adventure spanning 12 years. Streak played 65 tests for Zimbabwe and took 216 wickets and 189 ODI wickets, which gave him 239. To judo, and following the arrival of the equipment donated to the Judo Association of Zimbabwe by the International Federation, the local body is looking at launching a development program in schools across the country. The sport has been concentrated in Harare and National Association have been pushing to ensure it is a vibrant it is vibrant in other provinces. Among the several programs they're running is the inclusion of schools they believe will be a catalyst in achieving their goal in the long run. Zimbabwe got 10 sets of mats and 500 judo suits from the International Federation after Jazz President Smart Deke shared his vision to grow the sport locally with IJF President during the 2019 Congress in Tokyo. To football finally, and Zifa's first instance body yesterday afternoon inspected the renovations being carried out at the National Sports Stadium as initial stages to determine whether the venue is now fit to host the Warriors World Cup qualifiers. The Harare Stadium, together with all the grounds in the country, was banned from hosting any international match due to its poor standards. A date for a second inspection was set on the 15th of June, but the Continental Football Body should be given a guarantee that the renovations carried out are worth inspection. That is your local sports up. Hi, my name is Sean Williams, Zimbabwe cricket captain. You're listening to ZFM Sport. Z. Uh, let's talk about the all-time great Olympians. You know, Olympians break records, they shatter expectations, and they capture the imagination of the world. Now tonight, the Z team will feature six of them, starting with Chris, who will talk about the leading ladies in track and field, Alison Felix and Florence Griffith Joyner. Bear will then pick up the baton and talk about Usain Bolt and Jesse Owens. 
When it comes to the greatest Olympians of all time, two of my favorites and two names that will come up in your mind, Alison Felix and, of course, the fastest woman in the world, Flojo. We'll chat about Alison Felix first. She is the most decorated female Olympian in track and field history with a total of nine Olympic medals. She's also the most decorated athlete, male or female, in World Athletics Championships history with 18 career medals and also has the most number of gold medals, a total of 13. She competes in the 100 meters, 200 meters and 400 meters. She was born and raised in California, a daughter of a minister, and she believes that her running ability is a gift from God that she wants to use to the best of her ability. Her professional career began at 18 at the 2004 Olympics where she won silver. She went on to continue setting records and racking up medals at the 2008 Olympics. From 2010, Felix focused focused more on running the 400 meter races and running the 200 and 400 she became the first person to ever win the two IAAF Diamond League trophies in the same year. Between 2014 and 2015, she was forced to take a nine-month layoff because of a hamstring injury and coming back from that injury proved difficult. She was awkwardly placed fifth and sixth in her first few races, but she showed focus and determination like never before, getting to the World Championships and going on to win her first gold medal in the event with a personal best time of 49 Point two six seconds in the final. Got off to an uncharacteristically slow start in 2016 as during a gym workout in April she dropped from a pull-up bar and landed awkwardly twisting her ankle and tearing multiple ligaments. As a result she could barely walk and she had to switch up her training plan and this lady has some supreme bounce back ability because at the 2016 Rio Olympics she took her overall Olympic haul to nine, six golds and three silver. In 2018, she took a rather odd break from competition and it was later announced that she was indeed pregnant. Having a child is what would in fact begin her career as an activist. She accused Nike of being unsupportive when she gave birth to her daughter in November 2018. Nike wanted her back in competition as soon as possible, offering her a 70% Pay cut. Now, she asked for guarantees that if her performance dropped due to giving birth, she wouldn't be punished, but Nike declined. In May 2019, she penned an op-ed for the New York Times regarding her poor maternity treatment from Nike, represented entirely by men. Alicia Montano and Kara Gusha also echoed those complaints, but her seven-year sponsorship with Nike was not extended. She did, however, succeed in changing their policy. After broad outcry and congressional inquiry, Nike announced a new maternity policy for all sponsored athletes on the 12th of August. In this new contract, an athlete's pay and bonuses for 18 months around pregnancy. Three other athletic apparel companies added maternity protections for their sponsored athletes as well. Just 10 months after giving birth to her daughter, she secured gold in the mixed gender 4x400 meter relay at the World Athletics Championships, in turn topping Usain Bolt's record of 11, which had stood since 2013. The guys over at Nike must have been kicking themselves, and she planned to compete in her fifth Olympic Games this year, but as we all know, those have been postponed. She'll be back breaking more records soon as outside is open, and she's got the bounce back ability to do it in bucket loads. And speaking about Alison Felix, we must also speak about the women who came before and of course the fastest woman of all time. They call her Flojo and at the 1988 US Olympic trials in Indianapolis, a woman ran the 100 meters in 10.49 seconds, a world record that still stands. Even the announcer was stunned. Can't be. No one can run that fast, he said. At the Seoul Olympics that September, Griffith Joyner won gold in the 100 meters, 200 meters, and 4 by 100 meter relay, and set a 200 meter world record of 21.34 seconds that's yet to be broken. The woman who set that record is known by, of course, that single name Flojo, her full name Florence Griffith Joyner, and she remains the fastest woman in history. She smashed both records and stereotypes. You couldn't miss her on the track field wearing one legged racing suits. 
long three inch brightly painted fingernails flowing hair and of course flouting that idea that feminine fashion and sport don't mix the coaches at the time would have of course told her that all of these things would slow her down but she maintained her stance and continued to look completely different on the track what made her success in indianapolis and of course in seoul even more preposterous was the fact that she had given up on the athletics in 1986 spending the best part of a year working as a bank clerk and styling hair in the evenings when she retired when she decided to return to athletics in april 1987 she was more than a stone overweight a little over four months later she won the 200 meter silver at the world championships in rome and she just kept on getting better in 15 months he had metamorphosized from a fat average sprinter to a tout world beater. So where did she come from and how did she get here? Griffith Joyner was born and raised in California. She was athletic from a young age and she began running track meets as a child. While attending California State University and University of California, she continued to compete in track and field. And while still in college, she actually qualified for the 100 meters in 19, for the 1980 Olympics, but she didn't actually compete due to the US boy she didn't set her records without controversy though multiple allegations of performance enhancing drugs were lobbed in her direction the chairman of the ioc's medical commission later confirmed that she had been singled out for particularly rigorous testing in seoul because after all how could she who was she to do this after seoul she talked optimistically about the future and she planned to defend her titles at barcelona in 1992 and talked about competing in the 400 meters that made it all the more astonishing when she abruptly announced her retirement in february 1989 at the age of 29 i've decided to run on a different track and to strive for the best of which i'm capable in a different field she said at a press conference after her retirement from athletics, she remained a pop culture figure through endorsement deals, acting, and designing. Just to give you some more context on how great her achievements were, only three women ever have run under 1070. So that was Flojo, Marion Jones, and Carmelita Jetta. In September 1998, however, she was 38. She died suddenly in her sleep and the coroner concluded that she had passed away due to an epileptic seizure. Her husband, Al Joyner, specifically requested that her body be rigorously tested for signs of steroid abuse and, surprise, surprise, none were found. Interesting fact, these two women have one critical thing in common besides breaking stereotypes and records. They were both coached by the same man, Bob Kersey. In both of these stories, we see two athletes, we see just how much female athletes have to overcome before even reaching the track or field. Only outliers and people built to break the mold can achieve what they did. Besides, we all know, well-behaved women seldom make history. Z. Hi, this is Alexandra Maseko, and I'm the national basketball team captain, and you're listening to ZFM Sports. Z. In a conversation about the greatest Olympians of all time, we can't leave out the fastest man alive, Usain Bolt. But I think in uh, sprinting and legacy stakes, before there was Bolt, I think there was Jesse Owens. Yes, indeed. The two men, they come from different generations, but I think their impact and importance to their disciplines is absolutely indelible. And yes, you can actually say incredible. A lot of people would obviously argue and say that, oh, but if you're talking about Olympians, you've got to talk about Carl Lewis, you've got to talk about Mike. Michael Johnson and ironically these are athletes who uh, participated in similar disciplines to Bolt and Jesse Owens but for me I think the transcendental effect of Bolt and Owens makes them stand head and shoulders above uh, all the other Olympians uh, of that time and other generations as well because they managed to permeate and penetrate popular culture not only uh, be great sportsmen which Carl Lewis and Michael Johnson and all the others really are but Usain Bolt Jesse Owens managed to permeate popular culture let's take a look at Jesse Owens he was born James Cleveland Owens on the 12th of September 1913 in Oakville Alabama in the United States of America obviously the the question you want to ask is why then was he called Jesse if his name was James Cleveland Owens well the story is told that apparently 
His teacher asked for his name so that she could put it into her register. And he said JC for James Cleveland. But because of his strong southern accent, she thought he had said Jesse. That name stuck and he was known as Jesse Owens for the rest of his life. Phenomenal story. He specialized in sprints and long jump and was recognized in his lifetime by the New York Times as perhaps the greatest and most famous athlete in track and field history. Now, Owens first came to national attention in the United States when, as a student at East Technical High School, a high school, hey, in Cleveland, he equaled the world record of 9.4 seconds in the 100-yard dash. That's about 90 meters. So not to be confused with the 100 meters, but the 100 yard dash. And then he long jumped 24 feet, nine and a half inches. That's 7.56 meters at the 1933 National High School Championship in Chicago. You can see already at that stage in a high school, he was equaling the world record of the time. They could see they had something special. When he then attended Ohio State University, he broke all the collegiate records. But in 1936, he attended the Berlin Olympics in Germany. And he sailed on the SS Manhattan for Berlin, Germany for the Summer Olympics. Now, according to fellow American sprinter James Louvel, who won the bronze in the 400 meters. When they arrived at the Olympic Stadium, there were throngs of fans, many of them young girls, yelling, where is Jesse? Where is Jesse? There was no doubt there was one man they wanted to see in the Olympic, uh, the U.S. Olympic team, and that was Jesse Owens. Now, just before the competition, Adi Dassler visited Owens in the Olympic Village. He was the founder of Adidas Athletic Shoe Company, and he persuaded Owens to wear the Gerbruder Dassler Shoe Fabric Shoes, um, and this was the the first sponsorship of a male African-American athlete breaking barriers and a innovator as it were I was uh, he, he says I was at these Olympic uh, games that Jesse Owens went on to, it was at these uh, Olympic games that Jesse Owens went on to win gold in the 100 meter dash 200 meter dash and the 4x100 meter relay as well as the long jump now the story goes that after his long jump goal Adolf Hitler, leader of Germany, of course, Nazi Germany at the time, got up and left the stadium. That's the story that is told as a snub to the African-American athlete. Of course, we all know that the Nazi uh, Republic believed that the Aryan race was far superior than any any other race, any other uh, type of individual. So an African-American athlete winning at these games obviously would not have gone down well. That's the myth. The true story, according to Jesse Owens and reports afterwards, is that he walked past Hitler's box and Hitler actually saluted and waved at him and he waved back. So there was a bit of uh, camaraderie or uh, respect between the two men. And it was just a case that Hitler had a prescribed amount of time that he could be at the stadium and had to leave uh, at that time. The real thing that people do know is that the Democrat president in the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, FDR, didn't invite Jesse Owens to the White House when he received other Olympians. And this was largely because Owens was a very public uh, Republican and had refused to support FDR's campaign for the presidency. So that was the snub that actually existed. We'll never know the truth about the Hitler story, but certainly FDR did not invite him back to the White House. Now, Owens was a, a packet day cigarette smoker for 35 years starting at age 32 beginning in December 1979 he was hospitalized on and off with an extremely aggressive and drug resistant type of lung cancer he died at the age of 66 in Tucson Arizona on March 31st 1980 with his wife and other family members at his bedside let's take another quick look to our modern day Jesse Owens as it were and that is Usain Bolt his whole full name is Usain St. Leo Bolt Born on 21st of August 1986. Now, as a child, he attended Waldensia Primary, where he began showing his sprint potential when he ran in his parish annual national primary school meet. At the age of 12, Bolt had become the school's fastest runner over 100 meter distance. Upon his entry to William Nib Memorial High School, Bolt continued to focus on other sports, but his cricket coach noticed Bolt's speed on the pitch and urged him to try track and field events. In fact, it's cricket that was Bolt's first sport of interest he said that were he not a sprinter he would probably have been a fast bowler 
As a child, he is a big supporter of the Pakistani cricket team and admired bowling of Wacker Yunus. Of course, that Pakistani cricket team you'll know uh, comprised of the Sultans of Swing, Wacker Yunus and Wazim Akram. He also was a fan of Indian batsman Sachin Tendulkar, West Indian opener Chris Gale and Australian opener Matthew Hayden. During a charity cricket match later in life, Bolt clean bowled uh, Chris Gale and Chris Gale was very complimentary of Bolt's pace and swing and another cricketer who was very complimentary about uh, uh, Bolt's ability was West Indian fast bowling great Kirtley Ambrose but athletics it was and athletics is what we know him for he is a world record holder in the 100 meters 200 meters and 4 by 100 meters relay owing to his achievements and dominance in sprint competition he is widely considered to be the greatest sprinter of all time He's an eight-time Olympic gold medalist. Bolt is the only sprinter to win one Olympic 100 and 200 meter titles at three consecutive Olympics, as in 2008, 2012, and 2016. In addition, he won two 4x100 relay gold medal medals. He gained worldwide fame, of course, for his double sprint victory in world record times at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And I think that's where we all remember Usain Bolt arriving on the scene, on the global scene. And of course, with that lightning bolt uh, salute that you do at the end of his events. And it's that salute and his achievements that earned him the media nickname Lightning Bolt. His awards include the IAAF World Athlete of the Year, Track and Field Athlete of the Year, BBC Overseas Sports Personality of the Year three times. Four times he won the Laureus World Sportsman of the Year. He retired after the 2017 World Championships when he finished third in his last solo 100 meters race. He opted out of the 200 meters and pulled up in the four by 100 meter relay final. Now stating that he always had a lifelong dream to play professional football. In August 2018, Bolt began training with Australian A-League club, the Central Coast Mariners as a left winger. On the 12th of October, 2018, Bolt scored twice for the team in a friendly match. And as we know, he is a lifelong Manchester United fan. He left the club following the following month and in January 2019 he chose not to pursue a career in a football except be an ardent supporter of his beloved Manchester United Usain Bolt the GOAT Z. Yes, when it comes to track and field, Usain Bolt is the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And his popularity led to the creation of the biographical film I Am Bolt, which was released in 2016, showing his life and all that other fancy stuff. Presently, he's enjoying retirement, he's got a couple of businesses he runs, and he still pursues charitable causes. But before Usain Bolt, there was the original OG, the back eye bullet, Jesse Owens, James Cleveland Owens, as we heard from Barry. And it's funny that his full name, J- James Cleveland Owens, and then the initials got JC Owens, but then that was later on confused to Jesse Owens, and then he just went by that. But no doubt, when it comes to sports history and that iconic fist pump up in the air, power to the people, Jesse Owens will always have a special place in Olympic history. But before we heard about the gentlemen of track and field, Chris talked about the iconic ladies in track and field, Alison Felix and Flo Joe, Florence Griffith Joyner. Now, Alison Felix was actually nicknamed Chicken Legs in high school because of her skinny legs and that she was light on her feet. But that took her to greatness. The greatness that she says comes from within. Like Chris told us that she believed that a gift was from God. Amen, sister. The funny thing is that we could have lost Felix to gymnastics, but we are thankful that she chose track and field. In fact, one of the people that inspired Alison Felix was actually Flo Jo, Florence Griffith Joyner, the queen of track and field. If there was anyone who brought style and grace and swagger to athletics, it was Flo Jo. Anyway, Flo Jo's place in history can also not be disputed. She continues to inspire generations of athletes. We've heard from Shelley and Fraser Price and Camelita Jita how much they look to Flo Jo. And in that way, we can see her legacy being carried through of unapologetically being yourself and being brave while you're competing and still looking like a lady if you want to. Now, let's keep the interaction going. The handle is at ZFM Sport on Facebook and Twitter. 
Coming up next is the Formula One report. Then we'll continue our conversation on the greatest Olympians of all time. Mike will dive into the swimming pool as we will talk about the legends that are Michael Phelps and Mark Spitz. From sunny Melbourne to the streets of Monaco, the deserts of Bahrain to the jungles of Brazil, get up to speed on the Formula One report. The Formula One Report is proudly brought to you by Zimoko, the home of F1 brands Mercedes-Benz and Alfa Romeo in Zimbabwe. Zimoko, specialized service for special brands. In this season where it's all dull and dreary, doom and gloom, we at Zimoko are endeavoring to throw a bit of sunshine into your life. Now, this week we're talking about our body repair center at our Douglas Road workshops in Southerton. Our body repair center is well known and respected for our world-class accident damage repairs on our specialized brands such as Mercedes-Benz, Jeep, Fiat, Mitsubishi and Haval where our work is carried out to the highest standard using genuine replacement parts and body panels as well as computerized color matching system. What that means is that if it's red, it's red. If it's silver, it certainly is silver. Now we'd also like to advise our customers we are also open to all vehicle brands and models. Whether you drive a Honda, a Toyota, a BMW, an Audi, a Nissan or an Isuzu, you name it, Zimoko is there to fix your car regardless of the brand. Our quotation turnaround time for straightforward repairs is instant and our quotation time on huge complex repairs takes about 24 hours and our parts procurement for these vehicles is excellent. We have a dedicated, qualified, skilled and highly experienced team of technicians who will get your vehicle back to pre-accident condition in no time. We also have good news for drivers of pickup trucks because we are offering rubberizing of pickup load trays for all makes and models of pickups and our pricing is very competitive. Stay tuned to find out more. Z. Thanks, Michael. Right straight into our Formula One report. And uh, McLaren boss uh, Zach Brown believes uh, Daniel Ricciardo is now convinced of the team's progress and future prospects two years after turning them down. The Woking team identified Ricciardo, a seven-time Grand Grand Prix winner, as the man to replace Carlos Sainz once it became clear that the Spaniard might move to Ferrari. McLaren held talks with Ricciardo when the Australian was last in the final year of a contract two years ago, but Ricciardo instead chose to move to Renault from Red Bull at the end of the 2018 season, Renault finished in a promising fourth place with nearly double the points of McLaren. But after a turnaround in uh, respective fortunes in 2019, when McLaren took fourth by a comfortable margin and signed uh, several key deals, including a Mercedes engine supply for 2021, Brown believes Ricardo has bought into their long-term plans. Z. We continue to talk about the Zimoko Body Repair Center. Now, don't forget, we also work closely with insurance companies. So in the event of any accident for whichever vehicle, brand, make or model you drive, please make sure you ask for a repair quotation from Zimoko for your vehicle. We also have a 24-hour recovery vehicle which can collect your vehicles from anywhere in Zimbabwe if you break down or are in an accident. For more information on our body repair center and our recovery vehicle, please visit our website which is zimoko.co.zw. We'd like to remind you, our Jeep fans, that we have special offers on our Jeep range of vehicles in stock in our showroom. The new sophisticated luxury Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 3 liter diesel is on special offer of 120,000 US dollars and the all new powerful Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT8 is on special offer for 128,000 dollars and the adventurous compact Jeep Compass Trailhawk 2.4 liter petrol is on special offer at 59,900 all prices are inclusive of our duty and VAT and include full manufacturer's warranty and a first free service at 10,000 kilometers. These special offer prices are while stocks last. For more information, please email us on sales at zimoko.co.zw or visit our showroom at the Sam Levy's Village, Borrowdale. 
Ferrari team principal uh, Matteo Benotto believes uh, Sebastian Vettel remains passionate about Formula One but does not know what the four-time world champion will do next when he leaves Ferrari at the end of 2020. In an interview, Benotto also admitted that the signing of Sainz for next year represented a gamble for the Scuderia given the new partnership with Charles Leclerc will give them their youngest lineup since 1968. Benotto is, however, confident it is a gamble worth taking to begin a new cycle as they bid to end their long wait for Formula One's world titles. Vettel, the four-time world champion who's been with the team since 2015, will leave at the end of the delayed season after he and the team decided against renewing his contract. Z. We'd like to remind our customers that our Borodell showroom in San Luis Village, our Borodell Service Center, and our Douglas Road Southerton workshops are open from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday to Friday. We are open following the Ministry of Health and World Health Organization guidelines on social distancing. Please note all customers visiting our premises will have a mandatory temperature check, must wear a mask, must sanitize their hands, and keep a distance of two meters between other customers and Zimoko employees. The Formula One Report is proudly brought to you by Zimoko, the home of F1 brands Mercedes-Benz and Alfa Romeo in Zimbabwe. Zimoko, specialized service for special brands. Hi, my name is Rudu Nishamba, my Toria's super striker. You're listening to ZFM Sports. The discussion of great Olympians is a very interesting one because it takes us down memory lane. It takes us through generations as we remember and reminisce on those fantastic Olympians and the achievements over the years. Barry Menandi uh, talking about Je- Jesse Owens. I mean, Jesse Owens uh, in the 30s, the man who embarrassed Adolf Hitler, the German dictator in his own capital in Berlin as the American broke record after a record. Much to the embarrassment of the Nazis and then Chris oh she just took me back to my childhood because Flo Joe was all the rave when we were going up and I do believe that her records actually still stand to this day but if we are to identify who sits on the throne when it comes to the Olympics if we were to label one individual as the greatest Olympian it has to be Michael Phelps because by the time he retired at the Rio 2016 Olympics at the age of 31 Michael Phelps had collected a total of 23 gold medals three silver medals and three bronze at the Olympics it's a record breaking hole that I believe is unlikely to be bettered for many years to come. You know, this is the equivalent of um, Lionel Messi's uh, six Ballon d'Ors. I don't see a player uh, in the history of the game that's going to come and dominate at the level of Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo uh, and start winning Ballon d'Or after Ballon d'Or. That's what Michael Phelps has done. I mean, the records that he has set in terms of his Olympic medal hall, I don't believe that we're ever going to see that record broken ever again. Because just to put it into perspective, guys, We talk about Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt has got nine gold medals, okay? Nine gold medals. But Michael Phelps at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing won eight gold medals in one Olympic Games, okay? So he won one less than uh, Usain Bolt's career hall in one Olympic Games. That is how huge Michael Phelps' achievements are. He's absolutely fantastic. And I want to take you to that 2008 Olympic Games because he had already won uh, gold medals and medals before that. But it's a 2008 Olympic medals that he really came to the fore because he took all gold medals in the eight events he contested in it. It was a feat unprecedented in any sport in the history of the Games. In topping the podium in the 100 meter and 200 meter butterfly, 200 meter freestyle, 200 meters and 400 meter individual medleys, and the 4 by 100 meter and 4 by 200 meter freestyle relays, and the 4 by 100 meter medley relays, the voracious Phelps posted seven world records and an Olympic record in the 100 meter butterfly. His exploits in the Chinese capital made him the most decorated of all Olympians with 14 gold medals. That's the level of achievement and performance I'm talking about in Beijing. Eight races, eight gold medals, seven world records. The other one, which wasn't a world record, was an Olympic record. We will, I can put my neck on the block and say that we will never see an Olympian of this nature ever again. In the pool 
or elsewhere. He was absolutely dominant. Actually, in 2016, Phelps posed for every one of his Olympic medals uh, with every one of his Olympic medals uh, with uh, the magazine Sports Illustrated. In total, they weighed eight kilograms. That's a staggering haul that will take some matching. But before Michael Phelps, there was the American swimmer, Mark Spitz, who was considered to have been the fastest swimmer in history until Michael Phelps came along. For six years, beginning in 1966, he dominated the sport, winning a world record seven gold medals in the 1972 Olympics held in Munich, West Germany. This was the most gold medals won by anyone in a single Olympiad, and each of his medal-winning performances broke a world swimming record. Spitz was also named World Swimmer of the Year in 1969, 1972, and 1972 so what Michael Phelps did in 2008 he broke the record of Mark Spitz and what he achieved at the Munich Olympic Games in 1972 so he went one better Mark Spitz seven gold medals seven world records and then you had of course Michael Phelps going one better with eight gold medals just taking you back to Mark Spitz uh, his father was actually the driving force behind his swimming career drilling into his son the maxim swimming isn't everything winning is and spitz took his father's advice to heart by the time he was 10 years old he held 17 national swimming records for his age group and one world record so he was the predecessor he was the forerunner for michael phelps a fantastic fantastic swimmer michael spitz totally dominated you know uh between 1968 and 1972 leading into 1976 and of course highlighted by those seven gold medals in 1972 in munich fantastic swimmer but michael phelps absolutely blew him out of the water and if you take a look at his olympic hall again i'll repeat it michael phelps 23 olympic gold medals and 28 medals in total. The other five are three silvers and two bronze medals. We are unlikely to ever see this record matched. Z. Ah, uh, no doubt when it comes to the Olympics, Michael Phelps is the GOAT. And there's someone who's a little bit into conspiracy theories. There's that one that Michael Phelps possesses extremely high lung capacity. Apparently, it's twice that of an average human. Uh, it's said that the average human has about uh, six liters. But Phelps had a lung capacity of about 12 liters, which enhanced oxygen to his muscles and that improved his performance in the swimming pool. But hey, all I know is that he's the GOAT. And how about his predecessor, Mark Spitz? The thing I like about these legends is that they leave iconic stories. Now, when it comes to Mark Spitz, he used to have this classic 70s greasy mustache. And since he was a bit of a cool kid of that generation, he even swam without any swimming goggles. Now, the story is, is that when he was asked why he's got a greasy mustache, he simply said that, you know, it helped him in his races, saying that the mustache didn't even slow him down. In fact, he said it deflected water away from his mouth, providing the streamlining necessary to swim as fast as he could. <laughs> wow! Now, this is the cracker. The next Olympics, all no Russian swimmers had a mustache. They all said it was a good look because of the legend that is Mark Spitz. You know, when it comes to the greatest of Olympians, it will be remiss of us not to give a nod to people like Carl Lewis. He was a beast in track and field. Gymnast Simone Bells. She's young, but she's already a legend. And there are other swimmers like Katie Ledecky and Natalie Coffin. And then also a special mention to our very own Kirsty Coventry, Africa's most decorated Olympian. Now that's a dope title. Now let's take a bit of a breather now with our play of the day and after that we'll head into the beautiful game for updates from the world of football. But before all that, let's go to Around the World in 60 for the latest in international sports news from Chris. Around the World in 60 Seconds International Sports News. Around the World in 60 is proudly brought to you by DSTV. We take off in New Zealand where Locke Scott Barrett has pleasure 
his future to the All Blacks after re-signing with the New Zealand Rugby and Crusaders until 2023. The news was confirmed on the All Blacks official website and All Blacks head coach Ian Foster was quick to welcome the re-signing of the 36 test lock. Adept at set-piece play, active around the park and strong on defence, the 26-year-old five test tries also paint the picture of a player with strong ball running ability. The man affectionately known as Scooter took over the captaincy at the Crusaders from Sam Whitelock this year and led them to the top of the New Zealand conference when the competition was suspended after seven rounds. We head over to England where Tyson Fury has warned that he wants a dominant world title reign like Vladimir Klitschko and intends to remain as the number one heavyweight until he retires. Fury ended Klitschko's long spell as a unified champion with a points win in 2015, then became a two-time world title holder with a sensational stoppage win over Deontay Wilder in February this year. The unbeaten 31-year-old is no longer striving for recognition or financial reward after claiming every major belt in the division, but he revealed how his mental health has benefited from his continued dedication to the sport. We touched down in the United States where LeBron James reiterated on Monday that he's hopeful the NBA season can resume with the caveat that the health and well-being of players won't be jeopardized by a return to play. The Los Angeles Lakers star speaking on the uninterrupted platform's WRTS after-party show that was released on Monday said it remains his wish that the season comes back sooner rather than later. The NBA suspended the season on the 11th of March because of the coronavirus pandemic. Now here's something to look forward to tonight at 8.30pm, Football Out of Their Skin Part 2. So it's a moving and important football documentary miniseries. Football legend Ian Wright investigates the black players of the Premier League and their challenges based on their colour. Hi, I'm Various Coach Zdravko Logarusic and you are listening to ZFM Sport. Sports with a difference. Z. The big leagues. The big teams. The big players. The beautiful game on ZFM Sport. Horsepower unmatched. Talk to beat the best. Speed unrivaled. Sleek and easy on the eye. Let's get behind the wheel of football engineered to perfection. The Bundesliga, made in Germany. The Bundesliga certainly is leading the way. German efficiency at its best. News is that Bayer Leverkusen head coach Peter Boss has praised special player Kai Havertz but insists the in-demand star can improve amid growing interest. Havertz continued to, to build on his budding reputation with the first half brace as Bayer Leverkusen crushed lowly Werder Bremen 4-1 in the Bundesliga last night. The Germany international frequently the topic of transfer gossip columns amid links to Liverpool, Manchester to United and Arsenal opened the scoring in the 28th minute and restored Leverkusen's lead five minutes later following Theodore Gabri Selassie's equaliser. Let's hear from Kai Havertz after his impressive performance last night. It was very well set up, of course. It wasn't that difficult for me to get my head to it. I am pleased with every goal and to score two with my head is great. Z. Oh, what a fantastic player Kai Havertz is. Uh, He has been bang on form in 2020. You'd have thought he'd have lost his edge, you know, after that prolonged absence uh, from the playing field and from training, just uh, doing personalized training. But he has picked up right where he left off because if you take a look at his output, he has now scored 12 goals in all competitions this season, having netted 20 times last season. Just taking a look, of course, at his um, uh, uh, statistics. They're absolutely impressive okay he's got his eight goals he's got five assists he's not shy to take on shots at goal because he's got 39 in all and he has got no goals on the penalty spot so he doesn't take penalties for Bayer Leverkusen he is scoring from open play and it looks like he's a regular pick as well having played the vast majority of minutes that his team has featured in he's also decent in the air as well he's a tall rangy lad so he's able to put himself about when it comes to making aerial challenges he's prone to the odd uh, rush of the blood here and there because he's been booked about three times he's committed about 12 fouls but 
he is very versatile when it comes to attack able to play through the middle and also to pull out wide because he does come in with those assists and he does come in with a number of um, set pieces as well as crosses from those wide areas so very interesting player Kai Havertz and it's no surprise that he's attracting attention from bigger clubs elsewhere notably from England and if I take a look at the needs of English teams Manchester City I think Kun Aguero is going to need an understudy pretty soon I don't think Gabriel Jesus has, uh, has impressed or, or or performed to the level that uh, uh, Pep Guardiola would trust him as the man to lead the line uh, for Manchester City Manchester United just imagine if they played Rashford on the right Martial on the left and then they stuck Kai Havertz up front they would certainly have a front three that could possibly match Liverpool's deadly three of Sadio Mane Mohamed Salah and Roberto Firmino Chelsea as well Tammy Abraham is he the man to lead the Chelsea challenge in the premiership and in Europe I don't think so I think he's a decent enough striker but I see more of a being a, a squad player they could do with his services as well Arsenal certainly will do with his services if they manage to bag him but the question is Will Kai Havertz make that move to England now or will he carry on developing himself as a player at Bayer Leverkusen where he's not under media scrutiny, he's not under pressure, he doesn't have the weight of expectation as he would if you were to sign for a big club in England. But getting back to the game itself, a decent game uh, by uh, Bayer Leverkusen. They really weren't challenged that much. They weren't out of third or fourth gear but they were too good for uh, Veda Bremen on the night and uh, the impact of course uh, on the log table on the log standings that Bayer Leverkusen are now of course in fifth place or they remain in fifth place but they pull just one point uh, behind Red Bull Leipzig in fourth place so the race for Champions League places is well and truly on as for Werder Bremen they are nine points adrift of safety and the way they are playing I can't see them surviving. They really need to pull a rabbit out of the hat now if they're to survive and maintain their stay in the Bundesliga. Because at the moment right now, it looks like their fate may well be sealed together with the likes of Paderborn and Fortuna Dusseldorf. Z. All the rivalry. Here is Harry Kane for Tottenham. The stars. Oh, back here is Liverpool to in fact. Talk about impudence. Talk about improvisation. Talk about Sadio Mane. And all the game changing moments. And Raheem Sterling rattles at home. And once more, City are in front in a choice. All the updates from the Premier League on ZFM Sport. All right, now the Premier League is still planning for the current campaign to finish in July, but the prospect of fans returning to stadiums next season is looking increasingly remote. Officials are optimistic about the Premier League restarting in June, some three months after football was suspended due to the coronavirus pandemic, but there is an acknowledgement that plans may not be sufficiently advanced to ensure a return to action on June the 12th as initially hoped. So it's been back and forth on Project Restart with the uh, Premier League, and now they look look like they are actually um, seeking out the feasibility of starting the league on June the 12th. The great thing for football fans is that there is still a commitment to end the season and Chief Executive Richard Masters says the Premier League also remains hopeful the 2020-2021 season will begin in August or September and will be played in full following the conclusion of the current campaign. That's an important point to note as well because a lot of people have just been looking about at finishing the current season uh, and not really considering the fact that we are likely to go straight into the new season so picture this if the Premier League kicks off let's say mid-June uh, towards the latter part of June chances are it will conclude round about mid-July that will mean that round about August time three weeks or so later we will be seeing the Premier League continue and I don't think that's too much to ask because already players have had uh, quite a bit of, of rest and recuperation as it were this is a form of uh, off season so I think players will be ready to return to action as soon as this uh, season is concluded now clubs in the Premier League are already well aware of the possibility of a whole, the whole of next season being played behind closed doors which is a likelihood because the coronavirus pandemic doesn't look like it's going in 
anywhere uh, and we may need to get used to the idea of watching football as the synthetic version of football that we've been watching out of the Bundesliga without fans, without atmosphere, but simply enjoying the skills and ability of the players on the field of play. Now, the Premier League's medical advisor, Dr. Mark Gillette, has already warned that he has been given the indication from authorities that the social and public health situation is not going to change over the next six to 12 months. That's at least until we find a vaccine for the coronavirus. Can we go back into stadiums and go back to what will not necessarily be what used to be or a normal, but it'll certainly be the new normal. Z. Ah, we gotta go. Time is never a friend, but we'll be back tomorrow for Wacky Wednesday. Don't miss it. Until then, take off yourself and stay safe. And it's messy! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. The biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's ZFM Sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station.